Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM, the show where we get the world's most interesting folks. And today we've definitely got one of them, Bruce Schneier. Thanks for coming today, Bruce. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I got to jump right into the book, Click and Kill Everyone. A, incredible title. B, what's up? So the uh, title is Click Here to Kill Every Everybody. And uh, it is my first clickbait title. I, uh, I agree. And I'm not an alarmist writer, but what I'm talking about is the computerification of everything and what happens when computers can affect the world in a direct physical manner. That computers used to be about data, now they're about things. And computer failure used to be about Windows not working, and now it's going to be about your car not working. And we know how computers fail. They tend to fail all at once. So it's to evoke that notion of you could have these class breaks now on appliances and cars and medical devices and power plants and big real world things and not just your phones, computers, apps, and programs. And no one's really doing a good job of security. They just ship stuff and don't really worry about the bugs a lot of the times. Yeah, but that's what, that's what the market... Uh, that's what the market demands, right? You know, we don't want to pay for secure software, right? The joke for restaurants is good, fast, cheap, pick any two. Kind of works for software. And, and we, the consumers, the market chooses fast, cheap, feature rich over good. So that's what's supplied, right? There are exceptions like the space shuttle or airplane avionics, but they are much more expensive, much slower, much more labor and expertise intensive processes that we just don't want for our apps and for our things. So this, this insecure software, which is buggy software, poor quality software, is the norm and that's what's moving into everything. So yeah, that's the world. That's the world we, we like. And it was okay when it didn't matter. When it's about your phone, it kind of didn't matter. When it's about your car, it does. How do we deal with that? Because consumers are going out and eating McDonald's until they explode. Do we have to force this on people's throats, so to speak? Well, so the way to think of it is consumers, let's put it this way. It's how we act as consumers versus how we act as citizens. As consumers, we do what's in front of us. We make choices based on gut, uh, you know, the kind of stuff Kahneman writes about, that type one thinking, the emotive thinking. When we think as consumers, we make more considered choices, right? We make choices for, for health and safety and, and things that are good for the planet and society and not just, you know, eat at McDonald's. And the way we engage ourselves as citizens is through government, right? Government is the vehicle we use collectively to make decisions as citizens. And I argue in my book, I spend actually most of my book on this, is the policy. That the market won't fix this. Like the market is what we have now. This is what the market delivers us. If we want better, we need to engage our other collective decision-making capabilities. And that's law and policy and rules and regulations and ways we constrain ourselves as consumers. Right? As consumers, we are not allowed to buy food that will poison us. We are not allowed to buy homes that will collapse on us. Right? All of those things, right? we pass rules making that illegal or at least regulating it. And that same kind of thinking needs to start applying to the dangerous technology of computers, the now dangerous technology of computers. And, and, and I mean, that's a hard sell in the uh, sort of... Uh, neo-libertarian Silicon Valley government can't get out of the way mentality, but it really is the only way forward. Do we all have to move to Europe? Because at least Europe seems to have semi-efficient government and seems we, to get the problem. Well, we don't have to move to Europe. So, so, so you, you're asking a really interesting question, right? And, and, and that's going to be the national differences. And yes, Europe is certainly getting privacy in the way the U.S. isn't. European government is not as dysfunctional as U.S. is right now. Uh, but there are some differences. I mean, right now, the car that I buy in the United States is not the same car I buy in Mexico. Right? Environmental laws are different. 
So the, the manufacturers tune the engines to the different markets. But software doesn't really work that way. Software, you want to write once and sell everywhere. So right now, uh, Europe passed the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations. And, and you know this because now when you go on websites, you're getting a lot of warning messages and alerts and, and uh, click-throughs that you never had before, even though you're not in Europe. And that's because the companies have to want to ha want to have the same system everywhere. It's cheaper. And so if Europe passes a law, and I'm making this up, about uh, security of interconnected toys, the manufacturers will fix their security to meet the European regulation, and they're going to sell those toys everywhere in the world because that's easier than maintaining two different code bases, two different product lines. And there's no benefit to that. So it, it's laws in Europe affect us. Also, laws in the states affect everywhere else. So right now, California just passed an IoT, Internet of Things, uh, security law. It's not that great. It's something. It's a start. Doesn't take effect till 2020, but it is something. And when companies meet that law, you, wherever you are, wherever I am, we will benefit. Because again, that same toy, that same refrigerator, that same thermostat will be sold everywhere. So we don't have to move to Europe. We don't have to move to California to get the benefits of those laws. And that's, I think, an important consideration. And in some ways, a silver lining when you're looking at, as you point out, the kind of uh, dysfunctional U.S. federal government. But let's play devil's advocate. So my background is originally e-commerce and split testing is huge. You give people different versions of the website to see which will convert better. And if you figure out something that works well, you optimize for that. It's relatively easy to split test. Let's say in Europe, you have special rules about what you can show on a website. In the US, you don't just redirect and then try to avoid. It seems like, it seems like right now the companies are skirting a lot of the rules. They're pretty much putting up massive signs that say, click here to make this annoying pop-up go away and get back to the greatness. And that's right. So, and so what matters are the nature of the rules and the enforcement. So yes, right, companies are going to do their best to uh, follow the letter of the rules without following the spirit, to ignore the rules if there's no enforcement, to ignore the rules if the uh, fines are minimal. Right? I mean, that's, that's regular business. If we expect to change corporate behavior, we need to have rules that matter and enforcements in ways that matter. Now, I'm optimistic about Europe here. I mean, Europe is the regulatory superpower on the planet, and they do fine US companies amounts that make them take notice, not like the US that finds companies amounts that are rounding errors in their legal bills. So, you know, I'm hopeful here, but you are right. And, and that kind of split testing is, is how companies maximize their influence on us. I mean, they're trying to get us to do things. They're trying to control our behavior. They're trying to make money through our actions. And they're using a lot of these testings to try to figure out how to best control us as consumers. That's why I want to always want to step back and say, how do we act as citizens? Because once we are on Facebook and we see that warning message, you're 100% right. You don't read it. The message basically says, you know, click here to make me go away so you can do what you came here to do. Right? It's, no one's going to click through and read the policy and make the decision and do the thing because that's not what they're on Facebook for at the moment. They need to get them when they're off Facebook and make decisions there. That's hard to do. It's hard to engage us as citizens, but that's going to be the only way forward. Do you think it's become harder to engage citizens or has this always been a human problem? You know, I don't know, right? This is sort of way outside my area of expertise. You know, I, I, I watch the current politics with alarm, but I, you know, I don't have any better opinion on that than anybody else does, right? You know, I'm, I, I do computer security, right? I do security technology. So I know about privacy and security and tech, but you know, how to change our you know, level of political engagement you need actually a more interesting guest than me to do that. Do you think the nature of politics has changed forever just with the information we have and the ability to micro coerce people? 
I think there are, yes. So I think there are changes that are, that are one way, that this, this ability to influence. And, and, and think of it as broader than politics, because it really is surveillance capitalism. It's, it's detailed surveillance about individuals, and then the ability to craft messages targeted to the information gained from that surveillance and push them to individuals. Now, normally that is used to get you to, uh, to, to buy something with cash. Sometimes it is, get, it, is, it is used to get you to you know, buy something with your vote, right? to vote for somebody. But it really is the same thing. I mean, how can I influence your behavior at the moment of decision, right? at the cash register, in the ballot box? And there I think the uh, technology of attack, of doing that, has far outstripped our human ability to defend against that. And that is a change that is technologically permanent. The only way we can get back to the old ways is by making some of these practices illegal. In, in saying, look, you're not allowed to do this. Now, this is not a, this is not a new idea. Right? Back in the 1970s, I, I, like to, I always like telling this story. There was something called subliminal seduction. So I was a kid then, and the basic fear was, and I, I'm actually not making this up, that advertisers would put subliminal images in print advertising, particularly in the smoke of a cigarette ad or the ice of an alcohol ad. And they're like outlines of, of naked women or, or images of sex or, or just things that supposedly- The Coke bottle. Right, that supposedly would affect you subconsciously, make you more likely to buy the product. I actually have no idea if this was real or if this was made up. Right? I don't, but I do know that Congress freaked. They had hearings about this and they passed a law making those advertising practices illegal. Right? It is not, a, you're not allowed to do this. Now, right? The reason Congress passed that law is they feared, again, whether it's true or not, that this kind of subconscious advertising was too effective and, and unfair. So here we are, 2018, the, the, um, the manipulation advertisements are much, much greater, much, much more unfair, but no one has done anything legally. Is it because the governments work with corporations so they can control the individuals? You see that you a know, lot. I, so, so right. No, so, but, they, but they don't. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's more of a, a, a happy coincidence and not a, a, a conspiracy. Now, I think, you know, certainly uh, governments are much more beholden to corporate money. Right? There's a, so there's a long thread here about money in politics in the United States, which is, again, not my area of expertise, but I think that's important. So, uh, so, so governments are less likely to do things to annoy corporations because, because they need their cash, the politicians to, to stay reelected. But I, I think there are sort of other things going on. I think there is this, this belief in the US especially that government needs to, to stand back and not regulate tech, that any regulation is bad. And I think it just, just that doesn't make any sense, but, that, but that's the belief. And I think that, uh, that governments also like the fruits of this surveillance, that elections are now run through this kind of micro-targeting. So these same techniques that are used to sell you a car or a soft drink or a vacation are being used to sell you a candidate. And as long as the, the elected officials themselves are punch drunk, on big data and targeted advertising and these techniques, we're not gonna see controls against them, right? So, so we have a lot of big issues swirling around here. You know, I mean, I don't see a deliberate partnership. I kind of see an accidental partnership that both corporations and governments sort of independently want basically the same things and their actions reinforce each other. Not that they're getting into a room and deciding to do these things. Do you think we could get a tech billionaire to blackmail politicians, basically looking at elected officials, the people they're running against and run Facebook ads for their counterparts, basically popping up in their feeds going, hey, guess what, we can beat you. If you got a, if you got a tech billionaire, you could probably pull it off. 
wasn't this a, a subplot in the circle? I forget. That, I don't know. I have not I seen the circle. I, I, you know, I, 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 you know, I worry about solutions that involve even more money in politics. But, you know, I, I'm not sure how we can get our way out of it without having money on, you know, whatever the side we want. And the symptom is money in politics, that the amount of money necessary to, 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 to run, to win, is, is so great that politicians really become beholden. I mean, Larry Lessig writes about this, you know, pretty eloquently. He, he calls it a corruption. That even though it's not a quid pro quo, you give me money, I vote your way. It is a corruption because money is so necessary and politicians need to constantly ask for it. You know, and they know that when they ask for it, they need to deliver something in return. And whether it's a tax cut or a deregulation or a, uh, you know, even saying nice things in public, that's what they have to deliver on. Net neutrality. Which, uh, which tech company are you most worried about today in terms of data, privacy, control? You know, I, I worry about the, uh, the monopolies that are engaged in surveillance capitalism. So I'm worried about the, uh, the Facebooks and the Googles. Right, that their business model involves spying on people and manipulating them, right? unlike Apple, that, that, that you know, sells you cool stuff. And uh, they are so big that they can't be, you can't opt out. Right? That, you know, opting out of Facebook is, is a very difficult act. You, you can you claim it's easy, but it's, but it's not. I mean, I, I, oddly enough, I'm not on Facebook. I'm one of the few. And I, I notice the social cost almost every day. There are things that happen that I don't know about. There are events that happen that I'm not invited to. And, and that's a very hard cost for most people to bear. I, I try to limit my Google usage, but, but I can't eliminate, eliminate entirely. So those are the companies I tend to worry about. And it's that combination of surveillance capitalism as a business model and a monopolistic position that limits the amount of competition that makes them the most dangerous. Especially when they can just acquire the competition before they get big. Right, and, and, right. and, and that's another function of the, of the bigness. You look at the top 10 social media sites, they're either Google or, or they're, sorry, they're either Facebook or companies owned by Facebook, most of them, right? And that's that notion of, you know, we're gonna stifle competition by buying it up, not when it's nascent and nobody knows about it, when it's big and actually a potential rival. They can afford to do that. And this is sort of a new type of uh, monopoly. Do you think ultimately they'll get regulated or broken up? You know, ultimately is a long time. So let's I think, get, yes. Let's give it five years. Not a chance. I don't Not think it in five years. But, but, but I think ultimately, yes. Uh, I think they have to get regulated. That, uh, you know, we will start treating some of these things as, uh, as uh, utilities. And whether it's uh, internet access, companies like Comcast, uh, some of the basic internet functions like email or chat or you know, Facebook-like single panes where you can interact with friends, that these will turn into utilities because they, func they functionally are utilities. They're things that are necessary for society that we really can't opt out of and they should be treated more as, more as utilities than, uh, than sort of big, big startups. So I think they, they will turn into utilities. I, alternatively, I do think they will be broken up. I mean, uh, competition is necessary, but not sufficient. Right? If there were a dozen Facebooks, it would be better, but it wouldn't solve the problem. Because remember, these are natural monopolies. You know, pretty much no one's on Facebook because they want to be on Facebook. They're on Facebook because they, they have to be on Facebook because their friends are on Facebook, they're socialized on Facebook. And you, you sort of remember the moment where you had to join a, a, a social network. You didn't really want to, but everybody you knew was on it and you had to. So they're naturally accretive. The big tend to get bigger. So they're very hard. I mean, unlike the, the I think of when we, when we broke up uh, AT&T, it made sense. The baby bells were regional and you could just make regional companies because there was a natural way to break it in pieces. There's no natural way to break Facebook in pieces. Do you break it in, I don't know, national lines? Do you break it in social lines? Do you break it 
alphabetically, all the G's go here and the Q's go there, right? I mean, there's no, it doesn't make sense. You just split but, the acquisitions out. Facebook and- Splitting the acquisitions, splitting acquisitions makes a lot of sense. That's easy. But really, I think you have to go further. You need to have you know, different flavors of social networks. Like there's a Facebook and a LinkedIn you know, that are kind of the same and kind of different. LinkedIn's even worse. No one wants to be on there. No one wants to be on there. But a lot of us are on there, right? I'm not, but I'm kind of a freak. You know, and being a freak is part of my coquettish charm. And I can get away with it in a way that most people can't. And that's, that's hard. So yes, I like breaking up. And I think you're probably right, breaking up among more functional lines. So you go to Google and basically you take, you, you take alphabet and like, you know, break it up into pieces and now you're all separate companies. But it's still not going to solve you know, the Google search, which is incredibly intimate surveillance capitalism. And then Facebook as Facebook, which is also incredibly intimate surveillance capitalism. So it doesn't solve that. But it does, it does help. And that's why I see regulation as the only answer. My non, not in five years answer is because, you know, U.S. government is now so dysfunctional and, and we're just not, not going to see it yet. But I think it really is the end game. And you fast forward 20, 30 years and certainly that will happen. Do you think it'll be the U.S. that tries to break them up or Europe? You know, I think it's Europe's going to try first. But they're U.S. companies. I mean, so what can Europe do? I mean, and I, here's where I, I actually don't know the law. You know, I, I don't know what kind of leverage Europe can, uh, can put on, on, on U.S. companies operating inside Europe. It you know, seems like they, they make up the laws to be convenient and then post-date them and have fines. That's what, it, that's what it seems like has been playing out. So I'm not saying what they're doing is wrong. I think what they're doing is right. But they're definitely making up the yeah. rules and then putting old fines on. They have a different way of thinking than the U.S. does, and it does seem foreign, right? In the U.S. tends to be rights-based. You're allowed to do anything that is not explicitly prohibited. Europe tends to be per, uh, permissions-based, right? You are not allowed to do anything unless it's allowed. And, and that different philosophy shows up in different ways. And yeah, it does sometimes seem, sometimes seems that Europe is being arbitrary and capricious. Uh, People make very strong arguments that there's a strong, there's a big protectionist streak in what Europe is doing. I mean, they're trying to penalize U.S. companies in ways that advantage European companies, and there might be truisms in that. You know, so we got a whole lot of imperfect. But you know, I, I think Europe is moving in the right direction. I think the the way they're thinking about data and privacy and autonomy. Is, is a better way of thinking than we have in the U.S. In the so U it's, so I, I like that some of that's going to be exported. And we definitely can't complain about protectionism with cutting out Middle Eastern flights, cutting out Huawei, cutting out, uh, Jesus, tariffs. We, we don't have to get into tariffs. That's just a whole other story. Do you, think, uh, do you think it's possible to fix social media or will we have to completely break it up and start from scratch? I, I, I'm firmly of the belief that as things get older and older, they oftentimes get more inefficient, they get larger, and they get less innovative. So I think it would be very interesting to have experiments both on a governmental and a, a business type basis where after a certain amount of time, you restart. I think that the US government could really use a restart. We'll never get one, <laughs> but. That's a separate issue. Let's talk about that later. Uh, you know, I think restarts are good and often hard to do. Right? So Facebook is, in a sense, a restart, right? Facebook is a restart of Friendster and MySpace, and you know, there are several other uh, live journal, right? Ways of doing social networking that sort of didn't work out, and Facebook became the dominant. And, 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 it's, and it's an open question of how much of that was Facebook learning from the other's mistakes, how much it, it was an accident, and, and you know, Facebook happened to be the winner, but it, it wasn't at all preordained. So I think those kind of restarts are pretty common in, uh, in the tech sector, at least traditionally. The question now is, as the winners have gotten so big, can they make those restarts obsolete or not obsolete, non-viable, like not happen anymore? I mean, can Amazon actually ensure that there'll never be a restart of Amazon? Can Facebook now ensure that there'll never be a restart? Can Google do the same thing in search or, or you know, in email, but you know, we are seeing some, right? I mean, Slack is very much a restart of email. 
let's reimagine email for an, an always on broadband world. And this is what we get. And it's gained a lot of traction. I mean, it's not nearly as ubiquitous as email or, or Facebook or anything else, but it, you know, it, it's, it's successful. So does that count as a restart? Maybe. Uh, I think the problem with restarts is that we have so much invested in, in what exists. I, mean, I get asked all the time when I speak, you know, can we like redo the internet? This was the first internet. It obviously has lots of problems. Can we just start from scratch? Because if we started over, we could do a lot better job in so many ways. And the answer is yes in theory, but no in practice. That there's so much invested in internet hardware and software and systems and protocols and businesses and companies that we can never say, okay, we're done with that. Let's start over. That'll never happen. You can only have incremental changes. What about China? Yeah. China can do anything. China, but they can't, right? They can have their own versions of Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp and Amazon, but they can't redo the protocols. They're still doing the same TCP IP and the same operating systems and the same hardware and the same software. They just have different companies running similar businesses. So even China can only do their own thing at the very top level. So I think that's, that's, that's important to, 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 to see. So I, I'm not optimistic about restarts. I'm more in business. I mean, if there was a cleverer way to do Twitter, I mean, like Twitter is a freaking disaster right now. And if someone came up with a cleverer way, it, it has a chance of winning. It's a hard road, but it's got a chance. But if I give you a clever way to do packet routing, it's like, so what? I mean, I've been trying for 20 years to get incremental security changes in the basic internet protocols, IPv6, DNSSEC, right? I mean, all of these little bits of security, and it's hard because people don't want to, to spend the money to upgrade. And we're talking about much more major changes. So I'm not optimistic there, although I kind of you know, wish it would happen. How do you think about IoT, the future of smart home security? A little of the stuff we were talking about earlier that's exploding in both importance and just amount. So this is a lot of my book, right? You know, how do we deal with this proliferation of computers that affect the world in a direct physical manner. Right? So we have the computer insecurities, that's not new, but now instead of you know, someone crashing your uh, spreadsheet and you lose your data, they crash your car and you lose your life. Right? Instead of, or there's ransomware against your refrigerator. Right? It's not gonna open unless you give $50 in Bitcoin to somebody and now you can't eat dinner. Or even worse, the, the refrigerator turns off and your meat is spoiling. I mean, Right? I can make this stuff up, but it's perfectly reasonable it's going to happen. Right? I've seen already ransomware against thermostats. It was in the lab, but you can imagine, you know, I pull that in the winter against some northern cities, and I can cause real property damage. So, right, so how do we fix this? In my book, I spent a lot of time about policy. There are also tech we need to do. And these tech problems you know, are hard, but they're, they're solvable. So I imagine that we will have in our homes, in our networks, smart routers, smart systems that oversee everything. This is kind of my general theory of resilience. So we need to make our systems more resilient. So, and, and Cisco, so Cisco's working on this exact thing. Uh, your router knows what's going on in the world. You plug in a refrigerator, it sees, oh look, right? The person's plugged this refrigerator into my network. It goes out to the internet, to the manufacturer, pulls down some kind of signed uses description. Okay, this is what the refrigerator is allowed to do on the internet. This is who it can talk to. This is what it's gonna say. This is what it's gonna get. Now I know what this refrigerator can do. If that refrigerator tries to do anything else, like send spam or you know, receive software updates from unauthorized people, I'm gonna block it, right? So I can imagine a smart device in your home monitoring the dangerous devices in your IoT network. So I think the answer is gonna be along those lines. And, and you know, we can add AI into this and make it a little more adaptive. You know, we can sort of think about how this might work, 
But that kind of resilience of things watching each other, I think is gonna be a strong part of the tech answer to how we get more security, given all this proliferation of insecure devices. What about backdoors? The US has been pushing Apple for forever, and we have the news now about Huawei with the US government, which may or may not be propaganda. Curious to hear your thoughts on both. All right, so they're separate. So let's, let's, let's talk about backdoors in general, and then about Huawei and, and supply chain. So, right, we've been debating backdoors since the mid-1990s. Uh, everybody in computer security, all the techies, have consistently been telling law enforcement, you can't have what you want. That I can't build a system that only provides the data when someone of the correct morals or with the correct legal documents asks for it. That backdoors are usable by, by everybody. And that is dangerous and insecure. And that's a decision you have to make. I mean, do you want the security of you know, this device being secure? Or do you want the security gained from this device being insecure and being able to spy on it? It really is a security versus security argument. A lot of us believe that the security of this device is paramount to the needs of law enforcement. That's more important. That calculus changes as soon as computers affect the world. When this device is being carried by heads of state, by legislators, by nuclear power plant operators, it is much more vital for this to be secure. When this device controls your car or your heart monitor, it's much more vital for this device to be secure. As we move to the IoT, this security versus security debate becomes way more lopsided because the price of backdoors is now much higher because now it's a price in life and property. Now, as part of that, we need to train the FBI in actually doing forensics without backdoors. I think that's important. But now we can't afford for the FBI to say, you know, we'll, we'll live with the insecurity in your computers and phones so we can catch the bad guys because that's too high a price to pay. Separate question. Let's talk about supply chain security. Now, you mentioned uh, Huawei. Sort of two stories from earlier this year. There was uh, Kaspersky, right? Can we trust a Russian-made antivirus program? And Huawei, can we trust a Chinese-made uh, internet switch? Also ZTE, can we trust a Chinese-made uh, phone handset? Now, those are very real questions. And it's not just the US asking them. I looked it up in 2014, China banned Kaspersky. They also banned the US company Symantec. Uh, India banned a bunch of, of apps from China. 1997, there was a debate in the United States about Checkpoint. Can we trust an Israeli made security product? Now, this is a very real question, but it's really just only the tip of the iceberg. Now, this might be a US device, but it's not made in the US. Its chips aren't made in the US. Its programmers carry, what, 100 different passports? And any one of those steps can subvert the security of this. Now, this is a, I call this an insurmountably hard problem because our industry is robustly international. That a US only iPhone might cost 10 times the price. No one would ever pay for it but anybody can subvert security. There's a paper two years ago, you could subvert the security of the iPhone with a malicious replacement screen. So it's kind of crazy. Now, two weeks ago, there's a big story on Bloomberg that China, so the story goes, that Chinese uh, a switch manufacturer added a surveillance chip into hardware that eventually made its way into the both Amazon and Apple cloud, right, into the, into the data centers. Story was denied by both Apple, Amazon, the DHS, uh, their uh, UK counterpart. Bloomberg is sticking to the story, saying there's, our sources are accurate. And, and the, the real lesson is that we actually don't know. We can't tell that doing this is really that easy and not uh, that indetectable. My ma I maintain that this particular story is probably not true because I think I've seen a photograph of the chip by now. That if in fact, this chip was dropped into hardware, we'd see a picture. 
And there are ways to do it without affecting hardware. And if I was China and I was subverting these, chip, these uh, systems, I would not do, it at the hard, I'd not do it at the board level, I would do it at the chip level. And that's much more undetectable. And this is not just China, not just Russia. One of the Snowden documents uh, shows uh, the NSA intercepting a uh, Cisco router destined for the Syrian telephone company, opening up, inserting a back door, closing it up, and shipping it on. But this is a very complicated problem that we're mostly ignoring. And my fear is that lots of companies are in our data centers, uh, we're in their data centers, that it's a really kind of a nightmare out there because offense is so much easier than defense. I know when I watched Snowden, you would just see that you could just take out Ukraine's power grid because cyber, cyber warfare these days is so advanced and cyber defense is so much harder. Is that a problem that's solvable? It's solvable, but it's not easy, right? And, and the Russia has twice successfully attacked the Ukrainian power grid. I mean, never taking out the entire country, but taking out pieces of it through cyber attacks. Right? This, I, I lead my book with, with these stories. So yeah, these are real risks. We know that uh, Russia has penetrated the US power grid in many places. We believe China's done the same. I guarantee you the US has penetrated other people's power grids. Right? That's what nations are doing to each other. And this is really because, as you point out, attack is so much easier than defense. It is theoretically solvable. It is expensive. It is difficult in the US because the government doesn't control the corporate right? The corporations that run the power grid. So it's very hard for, for the government to step in and defend the power grid because it's in private hands. You know, you go to a country like China, they'll have an easier time politically doing it. But technically, it is very difficult. Now, I worry about this less in terms of nation states. You know, we're kind of used to the crazy world of mutually assured destruction, right? I can destroy you, you can destroy me, so neither of us are going to do it. Right? You know, we've spent a bunch of decades in that world and attacks on the power grid fall along the same lines. I worry more about the non-state actors, right? The criminals, uh, the political activists, you know, the kids, the kids trying to have fun because they're not as easily deterred in a way you can deter a nation state. And that's who I worry about more because the conventional statecraft defenses don't work. And you can make a fortune doing it. Bruce Willis had that great movie. I don't remember what it was. but It was, it was probably some fire. diehard movie. I, it, was di I, it was a diehard about a fire sale, essentially. I, you know, I stopped watching them after, after I think, the seconds. <laughs> when, when he still had hair. I have one last question for you. So I know, I know you're passionate about voting security, and I know we have major problems in the U.S. So just elaborate a little bit. Oh, man. Okay. It, it's, it, 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 we can spend a lot of time on this. Uh, Voting security is hard. It's, it's harder than most any other computer security aspect because of the anonymity technique. I mean, I'm often asked, if we can bank by the on the internet, why can't we vote on the internet? And the difference is votes are anonymous and banking isn't. If there's a banking hack or a problem, we can figure out what happened and unroll the transactions. Because of the anonymity of the vote, we can't do that. And that makes internet voting and computerized voting much, much more dangerous. So the correct way to vote is to have two things, a voter verifiable paper ballot and a risk limiting audit at the end. The gold standard right now are optical scan machines. I live in Minnesota, this is how we vote. You get a piece of paper with candidate names and ovals. You fill in the ovals with a, with a dark pencil or a pen. So you see the paper ballot, you feed it into a reader where the tally is calculated and that paper ballot is saved. You have the computer tally, you have the paper ballots that I looked at and know are correct that are usable for recounts. That is how you should vote. You can't do it via app, you can't do it via website, you must do it via in person. Then at the end, we have an automatic process called a risk limiting audit which is an audit that is keyed to the spread of, of, of the margin of victory. And you always do that. And this is how we secure voting. Any other way is much worse. I am very worried about experiments in internet voting and computerized voting. Because remember, elections serve two purposes. 
The obvious one is to pick the winner. The less obvious and equally important one is to convince the loser. To the extent that the losing side doesn't believe the vote was fair or accurate, democracy fails. We're kind and of there. Hacking the vote and the ability to hack the vote and the possibility of the vote being hacked threatens the legitimacy of the election, even if it doesn't happen. This is very dangerous. It's my understanding that in certain states, you can hack a voting machine with a screwdriver or a toothpick in like two minutes. Oh, you know, so current voting machine security is a disaster. And yes, lots of people have, uh, have analyzed the machines and written reports, and it, it's, it's, it's even worse than you think. <coughs> and while, while there are no proven incidents of vote hacking, there are lots of times when we don't know if it happened, and there are, there are proven errors. They're not enemy action, but things that are obviously wrong. You open up a machine and no votes were counted, or the number of votes tallied is greater than the number of people voted, or someone got a negative number of votes, right? And these things have all happened. We're pretty sure they are not enemy action. But, you know, what do you do? We don't have a really good procedure for fixing those things, right? This is why a voter verifiable paper ballot is essential. When the computer messes up, you can fix it. Right? There's a property we want in our, in our voting machines called uh, computer independence that we can tally the vote even if the computer fails. That's vital. So blockchain's a no-go? Blockchain doesn't actually solve any problems I have in voting. Okay. It only makes it worse because it, it destroys software independence. Inter okay, because it's all one system. Right. And I have to use it. I can't not use it. Interesting. I feel like you could probably get rid of the anonymity in voting because if I look at your Facebook page, I know who you're going to vote for. So, so if you got rid of the anonymity in voting, I can secure it easily. I mean, it's trivial now. Right? You vote. Uh, your vote appears on this, this public website. You can look at it, verify that it's there, verify the count, verify everybody. If you can eliminate anonymity in voting, it is now an easy security problem. Now, we can argue whether democracy is served by that, and that is kind of like above my pay grade. But yes, eliminate anonymity, and this becomes an easy problem to solve. You can vote by, you can vote by website as much as you want. Interesting. And, and your argument is that we kind of don't have anonymity voting. But you know, I think we do. I think there, you know, we could say that as, as, as sort of autonomous males, but I think, you know, you wander around the country and there are women who, you know, publicly have to support their husband's position, but in the ballot box can vote what they want. I think as you get to people who are, have sort of less power, that the ability to go into a ballot, uh, into a ballot box and in the privacy of that ballot box, vote how they want is still an important property. What about forced Voting. So I know in Australia they have forced voting and they're up to like 98% voter turnout. You know, right? Again, this is kind of above my pay grade. It's not really a security uh, discussion, but it feels like increased voter turnout is a good thing. Voter suppression is a bad thing. But, you know, I, I, I like participation. I think, I think in Japan also, I think voting is mandatory. It just makes sense because otherwise it's only people I, that... And making the election day a national holiday makes sense and, and allowing early voting makes sense and not requiring registration. I mean, this notion that you have to register, you know, automatically have the ability to vote. These are all American techniques that are being used for voter, voter suppression. And don't forget gerrymandering. I'm going to move you yeah, somewhere well, else. Mean, the actual voter suppression, right? Mm -hmm. Gerrymandering and, uh, you know, pulling people off voter rolls and sort of all, all that, you know, actual voter suppression. This is sort of, you know, half voter suppression. Basically, we're still hustling like gangs in New York. Bruce, I want to thank you for coming on the program. It's been a ton of fun. I know you need to run. Where is the best place for people to learn more about you, your books, what you do, all that good stuff? So my website is schneier.com, S-C-H-N-E-I-E-R. Presumably, you'll, you'll put the correct spelling uh, on, uh, under me at some point. Uh, that's where all my books are, my writings, my essays, my op-eds, my blog. I mean, everything is there, and that's where you should go. Perfect. We'll have links and everything in the show notes. And if you guys are just listening, it's Schneider, but without a D. That's the easiest way to spell it and find it. Thanks for coming today, Bruce. It's been a lot Thank of fun. Thank you. Cheers.